built for speed and power. Tank Destroyer was made to do one thing, kill Hitler's tanks. Where did the Stinger make its debut? The Stinger actually made its debut in combat, six of them, on Iwo Jima. Oh my god, at Iwo Jima. The Battle of Iwo Jima is one of the bloodiest of the Pacific War. With orders to never surrender, over 23,000 enemy soldiers are lying in wait when the Marines landed on February 19, 1945. The fight lasts 36 days. Almost 6,000 American and close to 19,000 Japanese men lose their lives before the island is finally secure. 22 Marines were awarded the Medal of Honor on Iwo Jima. Uh, that's 28% of the Medals of Honor that were awarded to Marines in World War II. As a matter of fact, one of the Marines who earned the Medal of Honor, Corporal Tony Stein, had a stinger in his hands. Wow, okay. But if you want to know the Iwo Jima story, there's somebody I have for you to meet. Let's meet him. You got it. Afternoon, sir. Afternoon. Bob Mueller, Paul Scholl. Mr. Mueller, Mr. Pleasure. Mueller was at Iwo Jima. Oh. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. 92-year-old Robert Mueller was one of the 70,000 Marines who fought at Iwo Jima. Landing in the sixth wave on day one, Robert fought for the entire duration of the 36-day campaign, which means he witnessed some of the most vicious fighting of the entire war. At the time, did you have any idea of what kind of fight you guys were going to get into? Absolutely not. It was supposed to be a three or four day campaign. And it was not? It was not. Paint a picture for us of what you saw. Very, very heavy fighting. And we knew that they were dug in very heavily. We would have a hard time rooting them out. The hardest part was just the daily struggle of it. We would get replacement guys who were fresh out of boot camp, so to speak. And they would last maybe two or three days, a lot of them, and they'd be killed. Uh, guys dropping right and left all over you. I was wounded on the 35th night by a grenade, exploded, and it went up around me and didn't, it hit me in the leg and the ass. I have a piece of shrapnel right here in my leg and it bothers me every February. Yeah. My souvenir. The iconic image of Iwo Jima is the raising of the flag. Yes, sir. The flag raising is uh, very, very special because it portrays a lot of the brains who got killed on Iwo Jima and it's a horrible, horrible battle, and it should never be forgotten. What was it like for you to have survived? I get sentimental when I think about it. The battle, the memories. I lost a lot of good friends, good buddies. Believe me, I'm very lucky that I survived like I did. Robert's story of Iwo Jima is an inspiring and terrifying insight into the battle the Stinger was built for. That being said, it's about time I got on with my mission. Mr. Mueller, thank you so much. It was an absolute honor to meet you, sir, and I am in awe of you and your fellow Marines. I have come to the final part of my D-Day rebuild, the infantry assault. To help me complete the picture, I am taking part in a reenactment exercise that's about to give me a taste of what it was like to storm the most heavily defended beach of the whole invasion. Omaha. The invasion requires all five targeted beaches to be taken on the same day. Because of its location, if Omaha fails, it creates a hole in the line, which means the other four beaches are open to German counterattack. But Omaha is manned by more German troops and guns than anywhere else in Normandy. Our reenactment using actors firing blanks won't come close to the real thing. But short of going back in time, it's the only way I'll be able to experience for myself what it was like. The rules are simple. Get caught in the line of sight of the enemy's MG42, you're a dead man.
We cannot advance because of the barbed wire. This is the problem. If Omaha Beach failed, that put the entire invasion in jeopardy. Oh my God, I'm shaking. This is incredible. What those guys faced, the same problem we're facing here today. We are pinned down and cannot move any farther. And without certain tools, we're dead in the water. Exactly right. In fact, it was one tool in particular, the Bangalore torpedo, an explosive device designed for exactly this kind of scenario. If I'm going to complete my D-Day rebuild, I need to understand what it was and how it was used. So I'm going to talk to a veteran who was actually there, who can help me solve this problem. General, I'm Paul Scholl. Hi, how are you, Paul? Nice to meet you. It's a nice pleasure. To meet you. Pleasure to meet you, sir. After graduating West Point, John Ron spent 36 years in the military. He served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, retiring a major general. On D-Day, John was a captain in the elite 5th Rangers Infantry Battalion. Can you take me back? to that day and to Omaha Beach? Of course. What was it like for you? As far as our mission was concerned, we were supposed to land at La Pointe d'Auc, right behind the Second Rangers. But when the lead wave of Second Rangers is nearly wiped out, John's battalion is diverted further east. From one of the only protected positions on the beach, John witnesses the slaughter happening all around. I saw men piled up on the seawall to about three feet high, and I'm talking men lying on top of men lying on top of men, huddling as close as they could get to the seawall. There was no other protection for them. So uh, to be caught on that beach, believe me, without uh, any way to get off was murder. There was nothing but wire, double apron wire, and it is almost impossible to breach. So the battalion commander told us to get out the Bangalores. Bangalore torpedoes are essentially massive pipe bombs, and on Omaha, they became critical. Here we had four gaps in the wire. Troops on the beach, uh, they just saw us moving, they grabbed their weapons and followed us. And without those Bangalore torpedoes, we never would have gotten off the beach. The Gatling. Invented in 1861 by American Richard Gatling, it has rotating barrels, just like the minigun. Hand cranked, it is one of the earliest suppressive fire weapons designed to keep the enemy pinned down. And this particular gun has an amazing history. So this was in the Spanish-American War? Yeah, you know, as a matter of fact, this is one of the guns that Roosevelt had. This was one of the four guns. Credited with the turn of the tide of San Juan Hill. Oh my god. Back in 1898, the US was at war with Spain. American forces invaded Cuba to put an end to Spanish colonial rule. It all came to a head on July 1st at the Battle of San Juan Hill. The Spanish hold the high ground. Facing them below are future President Theodore Roosevelt and the Rough Riders of the U.S. 1st Cavalry Division. Alongside them, the legendary Buffalo Soldiers of the 10th Cavalry. The Americans know that charging the hill will lead to a slaughter. Fire! So, to level the playing field, they wheel out their big guns. Gatlings. They unleash a withering hail of bullets on the Spanish, who have never experienced anything like it. The Gatlings keep the Spanish pinned down behind their parapets and pave the way for American forces to charge up the hill and take it. Basically, these laid down suppressive fire. That San Juan Hill they did, yes. Does this thing shoot? Oh, yeah. I think it would be neat to demonstrate what suppressive fire it truly is. Let's go fire a Gatling gun. OK. So how much does this weigh? About 700 pounds. 700 pounds. Not exactly easy to move around. The Battle of San Juan, they were using a Gatling gun from 600 yards. Today, we're going to use them from about 80 yards. And this is not a parapet like they had there. It's a wooden wall. But it'll demonstrate what 
suppressive fire really means. The target is set. Time to test the firepower of the actual weapon that helped win the day for the U.S. over 120 years ago. Gun is hot. That is really cool. And you know, it runs for 150 years old. It, it runs, runs the same way it did 150 years ago. Which is, from an engineering standpoint, amazing. Moving the traverse, moving the actual action of the Gatling gun. Now I see how suppressive fire works. Who the hell is gonna stick their head over the parapet when you got that much lead coming at you? The Gatling gun paves the way for everything that came after, including the minigun I'm trying to rebuild. 96-year-old Mickey Ganich was a sailor aboard the USS Pennsylvania, a battleship sitting at dry dock the day the Japanese launched their attack. I was there. I was 22 years old. We were scheduled to play the USS Arizona for a fleet football championship that day. It's early morning, Sunday, December 7th, 1941. Most sailors are just beginning their day. Mickey is suiting up for an intercrew football game. Suddenly, hundreds of fighter planes and bombers appear out of the sky. When did you understand that you guys were under attack? We're going to leave the ship at 8 o'clock, get ready for the scrimmage, and get ready for that game. Yeah. The attack came. Ship, all hands, man, your battle stations. My battle chase is up in the crow's nest. By the time I got up there, ships are burning. Buildings are burning there. Everybody's shooting. Planes flying all around there. The bomb had missed me by 45 feet. He went through two decks and exploded. Like a nightmare. Nightmare, but it was a real thing here. In two short hours, Japan's aerial armada levels the American naval base and surrounding airfields. More than 21 ships are damaged or destroyed, and almost 2,400 Americans are killed. There was nothing I could do. It just look around, see the slaughter that took place. All I could do is pray for them. I made it. I won the lucky ones that made it. The very next day, President Roosevelt declares war. To overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. But with the fleet at Pearl Harbor reduced to ashes, how did the United States come back from such a terrible defeat to win the war in the Pacific and help settle the score for men like Mickey Ganich? Mickey, an absolute pleasure to be with you today, sir. Larry Fiant enlisted in the US Army in 1969, and he spent his tour of duty not up in the gun box, but down in the cab. So I understand you were a, uh, a driver on the gun trucks. I was. I drove a five-ton gun truck called the Matchbox. The Matchbox. What was that like? It was at times like the Wild West, and I was surrounded by gunslingers and protection. I, was, I felt good. It was just when you went to work, the work was dirty. So the ambushes being on edge. Yeah, they, they could happen at any time. You're out on the road. You just you just didn't know. If the drivers didn't put the truck in the proper place, it was no good. You, the driver had to get the truck to where the gunners could do what they had to do. And speaking of the job getting done, what do you got for me today? We have a M72 Law rocket. The M72 Law is a shoulder-fired 66-millimeter anti-armor rocket launcher issued to American GIs during the Vietnam War. It's a single-use, disposable, deadly weapon. This is a subcal unit. Now, subcal meaning? This is a uh, training purposes. OK. But it'll give you the feel of the real deal. Because this is what, what I want to see 
something that you guys would comparably be up against, you know, in country. So this would give me a good oh, yeah. understanding of that. Yeah. One of the greatest threats to convoys is the rocket propelled grenade, or RPG. They can come from nowhere to smash vehicles and penetrate armor as thick as seven inches. Show me how it works. I will. This pin's removed from the back, flap down, this pulls out, sights, button, boom. Sights, <laughs> sights, button, boom. I like it. Even though this is a training weapon, the M72 is still a big step up from the AK-47. But the only way I'll know what it's like to be hit by an RPG is if I'm on target. Sammy, what do you think? Distance good? It's good. Larry? Good. All right, Jim? Good. OK. Now, how do we load this? Goes in here. This goes up. This 35 millimeter training rocket won't explode on impact, but it should penetrate our target in the same way the real thing was able to penetrate the side of a gun truck. Like that. We're loaded. Loaded. When I pull this out, it's going to arm this. And then I'm going to destroy that barrel. All right, I missed. I think I was high. I got a couple grandkids we can bring out here and hit. You want me to go get some rock? <laughs> You got one shot left, dude. All right. This is my last chance. Oh, right. Yeah. All right. Good Boom. Job. Smoke the barrel. We got smoke coming out of the damn thing. Let's go look at it. That rocket didn't just penetrate. It went through the barrel and out the other side, piercing the metal like it wasn't even there. I can't believe that this is the kind of thing that you guys were up against. What was the safest place on the truck? I don't believe there was one when it comes to stuff like this. The gunners thought the driver were, was in the worst spot because he had a big star on his door. The driver always thought the gunners were in the worst spot. But when you got hit with something like this, there was no safe spot. If you said you weren't afraid, I don't believe it, because I don't know any soldier that wasn't. But you had to control that. You had to get that under control, because you had other people depending on you. It became bigger than you. It became more important than you. It became taking care of your buddies and the ones you bonded with. That's a, that's a lot on the shoulders. It's clear to see why veterans like Sammy, Jim, and Larry still share such a strong bond so many years later. When war breaks out, Pat O'Neill teaches hand-to-hand -hand combat techniques to the most elite troops the Allies could put together. These techniques become the basis for many of the military and police fighting tactics we now use today. What O'Neill was tasked with is he was having to train shock troops or special forces. We got a whole bunch of these guys together in a unit, in foxholes, in trenches in the field, and colliding with groups of men in battle. So they were facing people around them at all angles and so forth, and they had to be able to fight multiple attackers at once. I gotta, I gotta try this stuff out. Can we play? Absolutely, let's do it. All right. OK, when this comes right here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chop this. Yeah, cool if you drop it, dude. Into it. I'm going to step right in here to grab your back, OK? Right here. And dude, you're going over. Okay? You're going oh, over and straight wow. down to the ground, OK? This guy cannot be stopped. Uh -huh. Like a chess master, uh -huh. he sees five uh -huh. moves ahead uh -huh. and knows uh -huh. what you're going to do uh -huh. before you do it. Okay. So from here, I'm going to move. Uh -huh. There we go. OK, the weapon starts to come into track on me. I redirect it and catch it offline, OK? Uh -huh. This automatically comes down into a wrist throw. From here, once you're down on the ground, I can do things like break the wrist, OK, or take the weapon, you know, whatever it is I'm going to do from here. Got it. You know what? I'd like to see you do this on me. I would love to do yes, this on Yes, I know you. you would by now. Let's do <laughs> this. Rack. Very nice. I love it. That is awesome. Meet Ryan Stacy, elite Canadian sniper and gun collector. Ryan is one of the world's leading competitive marksmen. 
And Ryan's putting me through what he calls the meat grinder to give me a sense of what it's like to be a sniper. Ryan? Uh, seriously? This is not gonna end well. Hey, Ryan? Uh, huh. Okay, I get it. A little trial by fire. It's so weird. The feeling of being hunted is freaking me out. Like, he could be watching me right now. That's really what's playing with my brain. The other thing is we are in the middle of nowhere. Ah! Where are you? Ryan! No, what, seriously? No way. Hey, buddy, how's it going? You killed me! Welcome to training. I had no idea you were that close. Sniper training, also known as the meat grinder. Let's get you in your ghillie suit. OK. <laughs> First worn by snipers in World War I, it helped them blend into their environment and stalk their prey. The ghillie suit is named after 19th century Scottish game wardens, who first created the suits to help them catch illegal poachers in their fields. Yeah, you're looking pretty good. But first, we got to dirty up your ghillie suit, so on your, on your stomach. Just go, lay down. Don't be pushing right sticks out of the way and stuff. Okay, roll around. Let's go. Put as much of it on you as you can. Oh. Roll it in. I think you're good. Let's go. First thing we're going to talk about a little bit is, is how to get from place to place. They use a technique called stalking. Let's do it. All right. You want to stay in as low and as flat to the ground, or you want to move as slowly as possible. Remember, there's a guy over on that other hill who, if he sees anything, he's going to rain mortars down on your butt. And a boy, oh, cracking is not good I either. I heard that. Your pants are falling off. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Come on down here. Kind of into this. We'll see how into it you are in a, in a few minutes. Oh. I want you to slither through this water, trying to be as quiet and as slow as you can. Think you can manage? Yeah. OK, let's see what you got. How's the water in there? It's cold. Don't think about the cold. It's not cold. Atta boy, keep going. Not trying to make much in the way of noise. Splashing, signs that people are going to see. Stay as low to the ground as you possibly can, right? I want your chin in the water. Just go under that one there. Oh, Christ. Atta boy, your pants falling off? <laughs> nice, using the logs as cover. Good. Outstanding. Oh. <laughs> I think you're good. Let's go. All right, I'll admit it. I'm not the most graceful sniper in the world, but hey, you gotta start somewhere. Pull up your pants. I knew you were gonna hug me, a bastard. <laughs> Carpenter, collector, and cannon builder. Steve Cameron's been fascinated with the Civil War since he was eight years old. Today, he belongs to a horse-drawn artillery reenactment group, but his greatest passion is making cannons for their live fire events. This is where I keep my collection. Oh, wow. So all these guns are reproductions. They're exact reproductions down to the thread pitch of the fastener. We need to get you proficient as a cannoneer. I think that it would be best if we taught you how to be a cannoneer on the 12-pound on the field howitzer. Why the howitzer? It's old school. This is old reliable right here. This is pre-war technology. I can't argue. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to argue with you, man. Easy now. Oh, okay. Easy wheel. now. Action front! Action front! OK, they get in the wheels. Basically, the cannoneers get in. And number five and the gunner unpedal it. And away go the horses. OK, then the, the gun is sp spun around. It's ready for action. Can we fire it? Let's do it. Let's do it. Come in, firing. Get the wheel! Show me what I need to do. Straighten your ass up and get up on the gun. Yes, sir. <laughs> Dylan, take him through it. So you step in, go all, all the way, way down to the bottom. All the way to the bottom. Yep. Now spin it. No, no. Turn it. Turn it. So you yes, want to get every every bit of surface area of the inside of the bore. It's your arm, so. Yeah. If you don't put out the burning embers from the last shot, one of them could set off the gunpowder when it's reloaded. Get that as best as you can. I think can. we're good. There you go. And then I get the heck out of the way. Oh, uh, no, you wait for the charge. 
So you're oh. still there. Okay, I'm still here. With canister, load! Ramming the potentially explosive charge down the barrel is really nerve wracking. This is when disaster could happen. If all the embers haven't been put out, bags of gunpowder were known to accidentally detonate, ripping arms off in the process. Take your other hand away from it. Yeah. One hand. Yes, One sir. Hand. One hand. OK. OK. Now draw it. Now step out of the wheel. OK, and then you come out. So oh. will you re we've ready! Got... OK, so they, he's given the command ready. You have the the uh, friction primer. They, they're going to step in and, and prick the bag Okay. to pierce the bag of powder to, before the piece is fired. Touchdown signal, that means the piece is sighted. And you'll step in. We'll insert the, insert the, the uh, friction primer. Yes. She's holding that. Go ahead and take it. OK. Obviously, it's going to fire if you pull it down. Stretch it out, stretch it out, stretch it out. What you're going to do is this. Look at my leg. Your hands out. You're going to do it just like this. Ha boom. OK. Are you ready? Yes, sir. Takes 30 pounds of pressure. Yes, sir. Face to your face, your left. Like this? On my command. Fire! <laughs> what do you think? What do you think I think? <laughs> this is, that was awesome. Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> May I? Yeah, please do. <laughs> That's got a bit of history, this one. That once belonged to Major General George Armstrong Custer. George Armstrong Custer. Fashion plate, headline chaser, leader of one of the most infamous cavalry charges in history. George tells me he recently bought the sword at auction for a whopping $30,000. He wanted it so badly, he cashed in his retirement savings to get it. This was Cus one, of Custer's, was one sword. of Custer's swords, yes. Letters that came with the German-made saber indicate that Custer gave the weapon to his eldest brother, Nevin, prior to Custer's death at the Battle of Little Bighorn. You don't mess with me, are you? No, no, not at all. Well documented. I'm the eighth owner. I don't exactly know what to say right now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, I'm actually, I'm sweating a little bit because yeah. it just, as soon as you said that, I'm like, there, no. Well, you're a fencer, so you like swords, and I thought you might like that piece. So Custer was a rock star. Yeah, of course he was. He was your first rock star. When you get to touch this, and you're like, I, it just, it's like a time machine. <laughs> it, it, does that sound stupid? No, no, because it actually takes you there. But just to say that his hand was here. His hand was on it. And our hand was, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. You know, I got to give it back to you, man, or I'll just. I know. <laughs> Don't you love it? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do, too. Now, I'm not firing this today. No, uh, it's our initial testing, uh, so uh, I'll put myself at risk. So how does it work? We're going to pressurize the fuel that's contained in this pot. The pressure will allow the fuel to be moved along through the fuel delivery hoses and through the main projector. A coil spark, which is at the uh, business end of the uh, n nozzle, allows the pilot flame to be initiated, which uh, then uh, allows the fuel projection stream to catch fire. How much pressure are we talking? We'll put about 50 PSI. Okay. In. The system normally runs at about 300. And we're not going to go to 300 because we'll be off the property with flames. Which would be neat to see, but probably not a good idea for right now. Neighbors. All right, let's test the pilot. Spark initiation. Oh. Nice. I can feel that already. A great pilot we've got. <laughs> Is that thing on fire? Uh, that's what it's supposed to do, Paul. For this test, I might just step away a little bit, if that's OK. Oh, totally. All right, so I'm going to kind of hang here for the event a little bit. Yeah, that's fine. You can be near an extinguisher for me in case there's uh, any issues. Copy that. OK, you can open the main fuel valve. Valve is open, you have pressure. Stand by. Even at less than a quarter of its normal operating pressure, the results are awe-inspiring. It instantly generates a jet of flame that burns at over 2,000 degrees. It reduces our target to scorched twigs in seconds. What does this say? 
Fighters by day, lovers by night, by fight, ready to fight. fight. Brilliant. I heard rumor that you were awarded the Navy Cross. Yes, sir. And what was that for? Uh, on the 2nd of August of 69, took some Army Lerps into the uh, bank over here, like on this side. Lerps, long range reconnaissance patrol. They were like the Navy SEALs or the Green Beret. In Vietnam, patrol boat crews were often tasked with transporting special ops teams into mission zones. We had gone up the river like this during the day to set up for uh, ambush at night. And we would pull into the bank, like over here. That night we went in, we dropped them off on this side and there were seven of them, and they got hit, four of them got killed. So I hopped off the boat with an M60. With his heavy M60 machine gun blasting, David held off between 35 and 50 enemy combatants. In the direct line of fire, David provided cover long enough for the two other sailors to evacuate the wounded and the dead. It was a feat of incredible courage that saved the lives of three Marines. What goes through your mind in a situation like that? Well, uh, at the time, it just comes to you that you need to do it to get the job done. Yeah. And these people were hurt, so we're going in to take care of them, make sure they got out. So here we've got literally one of each pattern of uniform for jungle fatigues and utilities that were used during the Vietnam War. And right above, you can see we have one of each type of jungle boot. Was it, was it heavy? It's incredibly heavy, Paul. I mean, the, the average infantryman can carry anywhere from 80 to 100 pounds on a, on a typical patrol. I'm just trying to get a sense of what that must have been like in, in the humidity and the, you know. You know, probably the best way to do it is to just put it all on and let you see how it feels. You're going to kit me out? I'm going to kit you out. Might as well. Let's do it. I want to get an idea of what GIs had to lug around the jungle. It'll have eight magazines for your rifle, two quarts of water, and a first aid pouch. I see where this is going already. <laughs> now, of course, eight magazines was not enough ammunition to carry. 14 more magazines. You have to have the quintessential Vietnam item, the helmet. And last but not least, every rifleman needs a rifle. So this will be your M16 for the day. Perfect. All right, Paul, go ahead and step up. Winner is? 233 pounds. OK, I'm 155. So we've got about 77 pounds worth of gear on. Oof. Almost 80 pounds. OK. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, to be honest with you, it's been a couple of minutes here, and I can already feel it in my shoulders a little bit. Well, and we'll go do a little exercise and see, see how, we how fare. it wears in after that, exactly. This is way harder than I expected. And running alongside an authentic M113 assault vehicle just like those used in Vietnam, makes the experience all the more intense. How are you doing, Paul? <sighs> I'm in fa fairly good shape, but dressed like this, in this much gear, we're in a country, it's 90 degrees by noon and 100% humidity, out for days with people trying to kill you. Hopefully, this will at least give everybody a little bit of an appreciation for just the physical constraints on it, not even getting into the middle or emotional no. part. German paratroopers weren't the only unit in the war to adopt a never-say-die ideology. In 1942, the Allies created their own elite special unit called the First Special Service Force, trained for airborne assault and to fight in the mountains, snow, and water. They were tasked with taking the most difficult positions and causing havoc behind enemy lines. The force are known for the remarkable record of never having lost a battle. The way they attacked when they first landed at Anzio, they seemed to be so strong in force what they sent forward, they assumed they were anywhere up to 20,000 men. Well, the truth was they were 800, and they were stretched so thin the Germans could have gotten through but they scare the daylights out of the See, church. and that's what it's all about, right? Is aggression. that aggression, yeah. right? If you have that true predator or true warriors, a little becomes a lot very quickly. Yeah, they did a lot of their night operations at Anzio. They really enjoyed it. And the Germans feared them. At the Battle of Anzio, four soldiers perfected their psychological tactics. 
As German night sentries took turns sleeping, the four soldiers would sneak up, pull out their V-42 knife, and attack in silence. Then, they'd leave an intimidating calling card, a death sticker slapped on the victim's helmet. When the sleeping sentry finally awoke, he'd find his dead buddy decorated with a death card and realize they could have got to him too. Before the Civil War, the Napoleon 1857 was considered the best piece of smoothbore light artillery on the battlefield. The 1857 fired 12-pound shots. It was utterly devastating at close range. I'm going to fire live ammo from one of the deadliest weapons of the Civil War. OK, we've got some targets set up out here at a couple hundred yards. This is awesome. And uh, we're going to teach you how to load this thing, sight it, and fire it, and see if you're good enough to hit any of those. I, that's, this is the big question. <laughs> it's not the most accurate cannon in the world. It is a smoothbore. Ready to do this? 12 pounders, buddy. I'm totally, <laughs> I'm totally stoked to do this. I've only ever fired blanks, so this would be my first time firing live ammunition. And if you don't know what you're doing, this can be extremely dangerous. OK, this is a modified pendulum hoss sight. And so what you want to do is you want to put the, the point of the front sight center in this on your target. OK, I straddle this. You imagine doing this in theater? Under fire, my word. OK, we're loaded, we're sighted. Now this. Now the fuse. Fire in the hole! Takes a long time. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> I missed my first attempt, but firing this Napoleon is intense. The anticipation of the wick, because you never know, you know when it's it, going to go. It's horrible. It's horrible. And you're just waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting, and then all of a sudden, boom. Oh my god. OK, can we do it again? Oh, you bet. All right, <laughs> let's do that. <laughs> Little bit muzzle right, and I think we're, we're good we'll to go. We'll have it. Fire in the hole! Dead that one. Dead <laughs> it's still leaking. Yeah. I love it. OK, so we've hit it. We've made the correction. I saw it hit, and it skipped off and is hella gone. What a shot. Whew. Congratulations. You hit the target. Should we do it again? Oh, yeah. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. awesome. The Civil War, without parallel, the most bloody conflict in American history. Fought in hundreds of places, places like this, Tennessee. 150 years ago, this place, Fort Dickerson, looked nothing like the quiet parkland you see here today. Built in 1863 to defend Union positions in Knoxville, Tennessee, it was the scene of carnage and confusion. All told, over 600,000 soldiers died during the fighting. Weapon advances at that time were unparalleled. From hand grenades to repeating rifles, the Civil War witnessed the birth of increasingly devastating weapons. Among the deadliest of them all, the 10-pound Parrot, first built in 1861 by a captain in the Federal Forces. The Parrot was part of a revolutionary gun technology that was being brought to field artillery. Rifling. Rifled artillery have grooves cut on the inside of the barrel. The grooves cause a launched projectile to spin as it exits the barrel. This gives rifled guns the ability to fire projectiles further and with greater accuracy than unrifled weapons, known as smoothbores. Engineers had known about rifling for a long time, but technologies needed to build rifled cannons on a mass scale were only developed in the years leading up to the Civil War. I'm going to try to settle a 70-year-old argument. What was the best sniper rifle of the Second World War? For the final shootout between the M1 Garand and the Springfield, I'm here to meet Mike Puente. This guy is the real deal. For over 10 years, he's been a SWAT team instructor and sniper. This point, the M1 Garand sniper variant, mm -hmm. Hands down is, is is my favorite. Well, I think with the Springfield here, I'm going to lean towards that one. Yeah? I'm a bolt action guy. OK. I, so my money's over there. I want to run both through their paces, see what I can hit, and uh, we'll make a decision. Sounds good. Let's see what you got. 
All right, Paul, so you're going to start off with the 03 Springfield on this drill. Mm -hmm. Your targets are all down range. When we say go, you're going to move to the first orange marker on the ground. From a standing position, you get two shots. If you hit it on your first shot, then you move on to the next okay. frame. The next frame, you're going to go to a kneeling position. At the final station, you're going to go to prone off the pack, and you're going to hit one of the balloons. You get two shots. Okay. You have to do everything in one minute. One okay. minute? One minute, OK? What I'm concerned is about what you're wearing. I'm not sure how this clothing is going to work out while you're doing this drill. This isn't exactly sniper clothing. See, I didn't get that memo. It does look like I'm going to a Glenn Campbell concert. Yeah. <laughs> but here we are. The Springfield is often voted the most accurate sniper rifle of World War II. Ready? Now it's my turn to cast a ballot. Sit. <clears throat> Fifty-two seconds. Good job. Okay, I'm really feeling that. Uh, the target was easy to sight. I liked. I liked everything about it. The issue I think I was having for right now, the level I'm at, mm -hmm. every time on the Springfield, I gotta reset the bolt. I gotta. I gotta reset my mechanics, which I think, I think in theory, is making me slower. Oh man, this is gonna be a tough decision, buddy. <laughs> it's tough. I guess we try the M1 now and see how they kind of stack up. Sounds good. Let's do it. Ready. Job. 53 seconds. That feels really good. Really good. After shooting all of the top World War II sniper rifles, I've landed on the American made M1 Garand. For me, it's what I would bring onto the battlefield. For me, it's got to be the 03 Springfield, man. Hate to disagree with you. I get the fact that, you know, because you dudes are in a bit of a different class. I so tell it's you, like. I think I'm... the tight pants are constricting your blood flow to your brain. Would it help if I had rhinestones? <laughs> no. You ever ask yourself who the deadliest soldier on a battlefield is? Not only physically, but psychologically? For me, it's the sniper. During World War II, snipers played a key role on many battlefields. Hidden amongst the rubble of bombed out cities and armed with powerful weapons, they could often hold up the advances of entire units one of the deadliest snipers of the Second World War, with 309 confirmed kills, the famous Russian sniper, Lyudmila Pavlichenko. The Russians needed all hands on deck at the start of the war and recruited many great female snipers. The massive German advance into Russia afforded her ample targets, and she was a deadly shot. June 26, 1944. German sniper Ernst Pelsmann has been busy picking off invading allies one by one from his undetectable dugout. Finally, he runs out of ammo. A British soldier immediately steps up and executes him. When they finally counted all the bodies, they discovered Pelsmann and his rifle had killed an incredible 30 soldiers from one hideout. Snipers had the ability to change the course of history with one shot, one kill. Forged in the furnace of the Second World War, built for speed and power, Tank Destroyer was made to do one thing, kill Hitler's tanks. This is a 1942 Achilles Tank Destroyer, one of the rarest military vehicles on the planet. Yet, it looks like a tank, but it's not. In World War II, tanks were used to support infantry and wreak havoc on enemy lines. Unleashed in early 1943, the Achilles take out Hitler's tanks. But like its namesake, the Achilles had a weak spot, very thin armor. Guns could shred it like paper. To survive, the Achilles relied on blazing speed and some serious firepower. As the war dragged on, the guns on most of the tank destroyers weren't strong enough to crack the armor 
of Hitler's newer, bigger tanks. But the Achilles was different. Its monster 17-pound gun could rip through almost anything on the battlefield. While chasing down a part for our Achilles tank destroyer, I've just come across one of its most terrifying foes, the infamous Pac-40, the backbone of Germany's anti-tank force. Unleashed following the invasion of the Soviet Union, this was probably the most feared anti-tank gun of the war. And this might be the only working Pac-40 in the country. Show me how to shoot this thing. Pat, you want to show them the mechanism down there? Sure. So right here is the traverse. OK. Right here is the elevation. Yep. And then usually the sight guy usually sits there and adjusts the cannon to okay. sight it in. So I would use the sight. I would use my traverse. I would use my elevation. I would find my target. In this case, an unsuspecting barrel. Target is locked. And now what? We load it. OK. <laughs> Oh, we're ready to shoot? Yes, sir, we are. All right, well, safety first. Eyes and ears. OK. Eyes and ears. My armor. I'm going to armor up. 75-year-old piece of artillery. Three-foot homemade projectile. What could go wrong? <laughs> OK. I have never experienced anything like that before in my life. It's like, um, it's like someone took a firecracker and directly inserted it into my sinus cavity. I sometimes <laughs> describe it as like a bitch smack from God. <laughs> There's one problem, though. Looks like we missed. To be forthright, I don't know what we hit, because the moment I hit, I hit the trigger, Everything went black and red. Like, everything went black and red. It exploded with enough force to hurl a three-foot shell down the barrel at almost 2,600 feet per second. Incredibly, experienced crews could get off more than 10 shots a minute. Let's shoot it again. Let's do it again. Let's, that's the great, greatest idea I've ever heard in my life. Three, two, one, fire in the hole! That barrel got off lucky. At this range, this monster could blast through half a foot of steel. It would have ripped through the inch and a half thick sides of our Achilles with ease. No wonder their crews were terrified of this weapon. I can taste what that sounded like. Some of the cannon guys have said it's like you're being reborn. You have that adrenaline rush, and it's like the whole world just opened up, and there you are. <laughs> this is truly a baptism by fire. I have been reborn. 